Good evening. Revelation 3, start with verse 14. This will be the letter to the church of Laodicea, otherwise known as the lukewarm church. Um, just a little background on Laodicea. Like the other churches, it was in the Roman province of Asia, which is modern-day Turkey. Um, all seven of these churches was on a trade route. They were like, like a little circle, and uh, they were all moderately pretty close to each other. Um, Laodicea was built on the river Lycus, and its original, original name was the city of Zeus. Um, it is now the modern, very near, modern day Turkish city of the Nizli, and it has about 650,000 people populated in that city. Um, but Laodicea was very prosperous, and uh, the people loved their leisure and games. There were many theaters, stadiums, and amphitheaters that had been found at the old um, ruins of Laodicea. It was only a few kilometers away from Coloss, and uh, that was where the Colossian church was at. Um, and the church in Laodicea was likely started in part by Epaphras, um, who ministered in Colossus. Paul also asked in his epistle to the Colossians that that be read also to the church of Laodicea, and that was in Colossians 4.16. So <clears throat> in, we've seen in all of our letters thus far, it starts off with a, a letter to the angel of the church, which is the leader of the church, and then Jesus gives a description of himself. Well, in the last six letters, Jesus' description came from chapter 1, John's vision of Jesus, how John saw Jesus. And uh, he used a segment, of, Jesus would use a segment of that description to each one of the churches that was specific to the needs of that church. It, it, it pertained to what they needed to hear from him. Um, but for Laodicea, he doesn't do this. He doesn't go back to his description in chapter 1. So it gives us a subtle hint that his interaction or this letter to the church of Laodicea is going to be different from the other churches. So we'll begin with um, Revelation 3.14. It says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. But we can see right off that was not in chapter 1, his description there. So uh, he starts off with calling himself the Amen. Amen is transliterated from Hebrew to English. It means we spell it the same way they did in Hebrew. Um, we say it a little bit, but we say Amen or Amen. In Hebrew, it was amen. Both vowels were, were long. Um, but uh, we use it at the end of prayers. But what does it mean? It's very closely connected with the idea of truth and reliability. Um, and the meaning can change slightly depending on the context that it's being used in. It's very interesting, Jesus often used this word at the beginning of sentences rather than the end. Wherever you see in English, Jesus saying, truly, truly, I say to you, the word in Hebrew he's using is amen, amen, I say to you. The word denotes the complete truth and veracity of the pronouncement. It's absolute. So when God says amen, amen, it means this is true. When we say it, it means let it be so. <clears throat> so his description as the amen is important. It means that he is the truth. Everything he's going to say is completely accurate. And uh, 
Jesus' letter to the lay of the sin was harsh and painful. Um, some may question his perspective or even argue that his interpretation of their situation is a little tough. But like it says, he is the amen, and there's no room for or any argument or varying perspectives because his is absolute. He goes on to say, the faithful and true witness. This description closely mirrors the first, where he says he was the amen, but not only does it emphasize the truth of what he's going to say and share with them, but it also reminds them of his motives. Um, he's faithful, and he is saying these things for their good because he is a faithful friend. Proverbs 27, 6 says the wounds of a friend are faithful. So he's doing it for their good. And he's telling them that he is. <clears throat> then he goes on to say the beginning of the creation of God. So he is the source of everything. He's reminding them of that. In John chapter 1 verse 3, it says all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So this description is also important for the Laodiceans. He made everything. He knows everything. He is the ultimate authority. And as their creator, his pronouncement about their condition is authority. Um, so in all things, Jesus' verdict stands. There can be no negotiation, no compromise, and the clear application for us is we better listen to his criticism and follow his advice. Do what he tells us. Um, we'll move on to verse 15, where he starts his criticism. Verse 15 reads, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. He's making them pretty hard. Um, Jesus was intimately familiar with the Laodicean church. For most of the churches, that's, that was comfort. He knew their love steadfastness he offered words of encouragement comfort and assurance but he did not like what he saw in the Laodicean church um, it's the only church that he gives no affirmation to no praise no words of encouragement I mean why it's clearly he's making a point he made it a point to comment on the good in the other churches so we can come to the simple conclusion that there's nothing good or praiseworthy in the church of Laodicea. And when we look at Jesus' description of them, it's sad. He's disgusted by them. Um, their behavior and attitude repulsed him. I mean, he's telling them he's going to vomit them out of his mouth. I mean, that's pretty bad. So let's look at his specific criticisms. The most famous Lukewarm. Um, I've heard sermon after sermon on this, and uh, <clears throat> it's true what you hear in the sermons that he's wishing they were hot or cold, you know, on fire or not, but they're just lukewarm. That's part of it. Um, and to our modern ears, yeah, it seems they're lacking passion, they're lacking zeal. Um, they're apathetic or lethargic, or lethargic, and that would certainly be a valid criticism. But to fully understand what Jesus is saying to the lay of the seeings, we need a little historical context of the sea. Um, and then we'll see it's way more scathing than what we think it is. Laodicea was about five miles from a sister city called Heropolis. Heropolis was famous for its hot springs, and they're still there today. 
Um, those springs have been used as a natural spa since the second century BC. Romans built big baths there. Um, and doctors also use those springs for the mineral rich water and healing properties of it. So that hot water, the hot water springs of Horopolis were highly coveted. On the other side of Laodicea, about 10 miles away, was the city of Colossus, where the Church of Colossians were. Um, <clears throat> Colossus had cold water coming down from the mountains. So they had a cool, refreshing water. And it was also highly coveted. And each was useful in its own way. Well, on the other hand, the city of Laodicea did not have those advantages. Aqueducts brought water into Laodicea from approximately six miles away. Um, by the time it arrived, it was lukewarm. Wasn't hot if it, if it came, was coming from hot springs, and it lost its coolness if it was coming from something cool. Um, visitors to the city would sometimes react by spitting the water out. It was tepid, worthless, and without any redeeming quality. <clears throat> um, and so the water of Laodicea was just like the church. No redeeming qualities at all and disgusting. Um, the Laodiceans would have instantly understood what Jesus was talking about here. Um, they had likely complained about their poor water themselves many times. It was the worst feature of the city, and now Jesus was comparing them to the water they had to drink that they didn't like. So when Jesus is saying, I wish you were either hot or cold, some think that it means, I wish you were either on fire of the Lord or hostile to him. Um, Jesus doesn't want anyone to be hostile. He does wish that the Laodicean church would have redeeming qualities and fruit indicative of a close relationship with him. Um, he wants them to be useful and valuable, but they're not. And they're disgusting to him and rejecting, and rejecting them, he spits them out. <clears throat> so, as we can see, it's a good bit bigger criticism than you first think at first. Um, he goes on to tell them, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. Laodicea was a self-sufficient church, a materialistic church. The city of Laodicea was very wealthy. The people there were well off. Um, it was located at a crossroads of two major trade routes. And they had two major industries in the city of Laodicea. First, they produced a rich, fine, luxurious wool that they sold all over that area to rich folks because you had to be rich to buy it. Um, it was very prized around the world. The native Laodiceans were generally clothed in this fine wool. Secondly, it was renowned for medicine and was home to a famous medicinal center of the time. They produced a eye salve, and it was supposed to be able to cure various types of eye diseases. Well, the riches generated from these two industries spurred a banking industry, um, which further multiplied their wealth. The banking center was home to a gold and currency exchange, and many people came there to get loans. So they had a textile industry, a medicinal industry, and a banking industry in, in their city. In AD 60, an earthquake shattered the city. Rome offered to rebuild it. The Laodicea was so rich and self-sufficient they declined Rome's help and rebuilt out of their own funds. So they were famously self-sufficient. And it, the, the same attitude clearly spread to the church. We can see it here, what he tells them. Um, they became prideful and focused on their worldly wealth. 
successful in the eyes of the world, they were the classic self-made man. Thus, they were a church that said, we don't need God, we're doing fine on our own. They pushed him out and excluded him from his own church. So, what kind of church was it? Is it even a church at all? In name only. Um, the power of God was absent from their lives. Perhaps going to church for them was like a social club, a place to look good, feel good about themselves, see their friends, swap stories of their successes. And sadly, there are many churches like this in the world today. Um, in the last hundred years, the Western church has been a prosperous one. People are well off and many are materialistic and self-sufficient. Many churches are like social clubs. People get dressed up, go to church, they meet their rich friends, they listen to a pep talk because there's no toe stepping in a lot of churches. Pastors don't step on toes, they don't tell it like it is. You see them on TV, some of these big churches, I mean, it's just feel good talks. Ain't no gospel in it. Um, <clears throat> they go to lunch, they play golf, expand their facilities, make them bigger so they can get other friends in. Um, but in their riches, they've forgotten God. Um, you don't ask questions like, what's God doing in your life? What'd you learn from the sermon today? That's getting too personal. A lot of folks get offended. Um, when you do that, you're crossing an unspoken line in these places. Um, <clears throat> Jesus isn't really someone they talk about. He's not somebody they need. That's getting too personal. And the fact is, these people love the gifts of God more than they love God. Mm. Um, they put him into a box. He's not welcome to come out unless they need him. <laughs> Matthew 19, 24 reads, again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. That was the problem for the rich at Laodicea. They say unto the Creator, I don't need you, it's, and it's no wonder that Jesus is disgusted by them and says, I'll spit you out of my mouth. If you don't need me, I don't need you, so to speak. Um, so we've seen how they describe themselves. We've talked about that. Now let's look how Jesus describes it. He says, And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. What a reproof. Uh, and that's a reproof for folks that's in a church that's supposed to be a church. Um, respectable, good-looking people, they look good in their own eyes but not in the eyes of God. Yeah. He viewed them for what they were. And it's also interesting that his uh, rebuke directly attacks their areas of misplaced pride. He says they're poor. But the Laodiceans were rich in the eyes of the world. They were wealthy. Uh, they had banking. They had trade. They had industry. Uh, but it was all for nothing. They didn't have riches where it counted. Spiritually, they were bankrupt. Ephesians 1, 7 through 8 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. The Laodiceans had not experienced the riches of God's grace and forgiveness because they hadn't come to him asking for it. They didn't realize they needed it. They thought they were set already. <clears throat> but so instead of seeking the riches of grace from God, they sought the riches of the world. 1 Timothy 6, 8, 6, 18 reads, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Well, neither were they rich in good works. A faithful follower of Jesus can be prosperous financially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if he is, 
he should use it generously for serving God. And there's no evidence that the Laodiceans did that. Um, there are stories like the rich fool in Luke who stored up treasures for himself his whole life. And Luke 12, 20 reads, But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? <clears throat> Remember that the Laodicea was a banking center. People came to them for loans. But they should have been coming to God for his riches. He goes on to call them blind. People came from far and wide to purchase their eye salve from their medical center <clears throat> from these Laodiceans. Thus they thought that not only could they see well, but they could op help open the eyes of others as well. But it was a case of the blind leading the blind. They should have come to Jesus to have their eyes open, but they didn't but they didn't even realize they were blind. Then he tells them they were naked. The Laodiceans prided themselves on their luxurious textile industry, on this luxurious, rich, fine wool they made. And if you were to visit ancient Laodicea, you'd see them wearing that rich black wool, which they sold to nobles and the wealthy far and wide. God wasn't impressed in the least. He saw right through their beautiful clothes to their heart condition. Um, you ever heard the story about the emperor who wore no clothes? You ever heard that one? Emperor wanted some, this emperor wanted some new clothes, and these two tailors came to him and said, we can make you the most beautiful, special clothes you've ever seen. They're so beautiful, they're invisible. So these two tailors set up shot and they set up their looms and they're sitting there and they're weaving fabric and sewing fabric, but <clears throat> there's nothing there. They're building, they're making these clothes for this emperor, but they're just going through the motions. They're not actually making them. But nobody wants to tell the emperor, because he's the emperor, that he's being scammed or they're tricking him. So, Everybody's telling him what fine clothes they are. Well, they finish making the clothes, and he puts them on and goes strutting through the city, butt naked. And he, he thinks he's just the best dressed thing around. So the Laodiceans were just like that emperor. Um, they were, this emperor was naked and shaming himself in front of the entire kingdom, and these Laodiceans were doing the same thing in front of God. Um, they, they were strutting around in their fine wool, but God saw them and see, saw them in the condition that they were in, which was naked as far as he was concerned. In the parable of the wedding feast, Jesus mentioned that every person must wear the clothes given by the king. Well, one guy goes in attempting to wear his own clothes and gets thrown out. No person can come to God depending on himself. Uh, if you say you need nothing, you can't get in. Right. And that's what they were saying. We, need, we don't need anything. Uh, but you have to be clothed in the clothes that God provides. So who's more needy than a person who is blind, naked, and poor? That's about as needy as you can possibly get, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, verse 18 says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the same shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. There we go. I got off the page. So the Laodiceans were used to visiting their banking center to make deposits and exchange gold. Jesus told them it's time to stop focusing on that and turn to him. And he's the only one who could give them the spiritual riches that they needed. 
So what's gold refined by fire? I believe it's a spiritual counterpart to their earthly gold, which they stored up. Uh, simply put, I think it's eternal life. And eternal life will last if it stands the test of time, and it never burn, rust, or be stolen. So Jesus' point's clear there. Stop spending all your time at the bank counting your money and start visiting his bank because his wealth lasts. In Matthew 6, 21, it says, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. There's three questions we can ask ourselves. And it will evaluate what's important to us. What do we spend our time thinking about? What do we spend our time doing? And what do we spend our money on? These three questions can reveal what's important to me, what's important to you. Um, if you spend your time thinking about how to make money, working as much overtime as possible to get more of it, and about where you're going to spend it, you probably love money. Um, and that's very common today because we live in a very materialistic culture. Used to, years ago, when, when, if, if my dad was living, he would be 96 if he was still living. When he started work, he found something he liked to do. But now you can have 10 jobs laid out one of them you'd really love to do, and the other nine, not so much, but the highest paid one's going to be the one folks pick, yeah. the one that'll pay them the most money every time in today's world. Then he goes on to say, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. So as mentioned before, the Laodiceans prided themselves in this, this luxurious black wool clothing. And it may have impressed most people, but it didn't impress Jesus. Imagine facing Jesus, <coughs> and he asked, why should I let you into heaven? And you say, well, just look at my fine clothes. <laughs> He's going to laugh you right back out after he spanks you pretty hard I imagine um, but the clothes you wear are important and the only clothes that he's going to accept are the ones he provides that rich black wool that's filthy rags in his sight um, we don't have anything good enough that's why what we wear has to come from him <clears throat> you see these these white garments that they talk about is mentioned several times in Revelation. Um, Revelation 3, 5 is what we're talking about. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. We'll be clothed. And I will never blot his name out of the book of life. Revelation 4, 4 talks about the 24 thrones seated on the thrones of 24 elders clothed in white garments. So even the elders have their clothes provided by God. <clears throat> then he goes on to say, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Here you see Jesus hitting the third industry. He's already hit the banking industry. He's already hit the textile industry about their clothes. Now he's hitting their medicine industry about their eye salve. He's telling them, buy eye salve from me. Uh, <clears throat> The salve they produced and sold couldn't open their eyes spiritually. But Jesus, I salve, could. And he's the light of the world. Uh, goes on in verse uh, 19. It says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. There's a first word of hope for these people that he's speaking to. He's telling them he loves them. He goes, and since I love you, 
I'm rebuking and chastening you. I'm correcting you. His, it says in the word that all God's word is good for discipline, chastening, rebuke, teaching. And uh, <clears throat> he's telling them, I, I'm spanking you like this because I love you. Yeah. And I want you to be with me. Repent. Yeah. Um, then he goes on and he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. They had excluded, excluded him from the church. Uh, they didn't need him. They were doing fine on their own. But he extends an invitation to them. He wanted to be part of their, their lives. He's standing there knocking. He does the same thing with us. And notice it says, anyone. It doesn't say Brother Sherrod or Brother Rip can open the door. It says anyone. All they got to do is, and he's coming in. Um, <clears throat> what, what that's telling us it is an individual, personal decision for each person. Brother Don can't make that decision for me to open that door. I have to make that decision. My wife has to make that decision. I can't make her. My kids have to make that decision for their own. I can't make them. All I can do is pray for them. Um, and he says, I will eat with him and he with me. <clears throat> and uh, that eating signifies a close personal relationship. You don't generally eat with strangers. It shows fellowship, and we eat with our friends and our families. And Jesus wants that relationship with us. He wanted that church, uh, relationship with the people that lay at the seat of church. Um, in verse 21, he goes on to say, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on, the th on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So he's telling them, just like he did in all the rest of the letters, if you overcome, you'll rule with me. You'll be in heaven. He, that's the promise. And he's, com he's actually comparing them to himself. He said, if you overcome, you'll sit with me, just as I overcame and sat with God. So he's sitting with God. You overcome, you're going to sit with him. Guess who you're sitting with, too? You're sitting with God. Um, then it ends with the same verse as always. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And uh, basically, we just need to pray and ask the Spirit, are we hearing what he's trying to tell us? <clears throat> that pretty well does the seven letters. <laughs> um, like Brother Don said, um, not next week, but the week after that. Um, me and Brother Don was talking. Most things in Revelation, you got to take it two ways. Um, we've looked at the literal in these seven letters. Um, we were basically looking at what was written and talking about literally what Jesus meant. But just most everything in Revelation, you got to look at a literal sense. Then you got to look at the prophetic end of it because it's, it's got two ways. It's two-way street. So uh, we'll close up the week after next, look, and we'll look at some of the prophetic end of these seven letters and uh, see what we can dig out of that. All right. Well done.